Uh, Dr. Elizabeth Shepherd has been Professor of Archives and Records Management at the Department of Information Studies at the University College London since 2011. Her, in, her research interests, which we're going to benefit from this afternoon, uh, are in rights in records, links between records management and information policy compliance and government administrative data. And there's a, there's a real rising theme coming up in terms of, as archivists, we are much more than just the passive recipients of records and then we, you know, we keep them until somebody asks to see them. We, we've, there's a lot more to be done uh, if we're really going to use archives and there's a lot more nuance in the way that the, uh, the records arrive to us in the first place and the way that we uh, deliberate access. So I'm not going to say any more because I'm very, very interested in hearing what Elizabeth has to say. So would you please join me in welcoming to the podium Dr Elizabeth Shepherd. Thank you. So thank you very much for that introduction. And thank you to ICA, ASA, Arantz for the invitation to speak. I am very privileged to be presenting on behalf of our wonderful group of care experienced co-researchers and it's their work that I want to present to you um, this morning. So records and archives give families and individuals access to shared histories and values. In family settings, written records and photographs document significant events, celebrations and milestones. But for some people, such as looked after children, these are missing. Many people who grew up in care have gaps in their memories and questions about their own lives. In the absence of family records, they make subject access requests to local authorities, charities, schools, the health service and others for answers. Organisational records contain their personal histories. Recent research at UCL brings together care leavers, academics, social workers and information and records professionals to explore the challenges this process presents. Mirror, memory, identity, rights and records and access is a two-year UK Arts and Humanities Research Council funded project which we carried out in partnership with the Care Leavers Association. Exploring information rights and responsibilities in child social care records. This paper will draw on the findings of the research to explore how Care Leavers experiences might inform human-centered and participatory approaches to caring record keeping. There are over 75,000 children and young people in care in England today, living either with foster parents, in residential homes or kinship care. It's estimated that about half a million British adults had some experience of out-of-home care during their childhoods. While individual experiences of care vary enormously, most care leavers share something in common. Their lives have been intensively documented by social workers, health workers, and carers. The Mirror Project is based at the Department of Information Studies at UCL. Our aim is to understand the role that records and record keeping play in child social care. We focused on the lifelong value of records for the people that they document. How does what is written about children and young people impact on them, not only while they're in care, but long into adulthood? And how could the processes of creating, managing, and providing access to records be positively changed to better support care leavers? These visual minutes from one of our workshops give you some sense of the themes we focused on. While this particular project has England as a case study, the findings are relevant to the wider UK and international context and speak to research and practice elsewhere in the world. MIRA is a participatory research project which has brought university researchers and care leavers together to address questions around access to records for care experienced people and the quality, content and management of those records. The research group, you can see some of them here, four academics and 11 care experienced co-researchers discussed which questions to ask, 
who to talk to, and most importantly, what we wanted to ultimately achieve. We want to generate a discussion that will lead to positive change for care leavers and support the social care and information practitioners who work with them. We've spoken to over 80 research contributors and our conclusions come directly from this body of research. We identified four key groups to speak to. These were care experienced people aged 18 plus whose lives are captured in the records. Social care practitioners who create and use records in their work. Information professionals who manage and provide access to the records and other researchers who use the records in their studies. In between and overlapping these core groups are other stakeholders who emerged during the project, including carers and family members, regulators like Ofsted and the Information Commissioner's Office, funders, government departments, historians, and ICSA, the Independent Inquiry into Child Sexual Abuse in the UK. Each of these groups has a perspective on child social care record keeping and different, sometimes conflicting, needs and rights in the records. For care leavers, the records may represent the only access they have to the circumstances of what happened to them as children. They may contain information about their identity as well as details of their past, which they either never knew or have forgotten. They have a right to request access to them. Many of our care experience co-researchers spoke about having to disentangle their life and themselves from the file. For social workers, the records are necessary to doing their jobs and safeguarding children, but they may also be burdensome and time consuming. For information managers, the records may be part of an organization's account of itself and its actions, subject to retention schedules, presenting storage and preservation challenges. For researchers, the records may provide insight into historical, sociological, or economic study. We wanted to understand how these rights and needs overlap and what impact they have. During the project, we examined six key theme areas in two strands. At the top, issues surrounding access to records for care experienced people, usually later in life, including redaction and the removal of third party information and the provision of access support services. Below, record keeping practices, including the language and content of records, records management procedures, digital systems and memory and identity work, for example, life story work. Why do this research? We were inspired by the work of the Access to Care Records campaign group report, It's My Journey, It's My Life, that set out the multiple challenges that care experienced people face when accessing their records. We were also very much inspired by the work done internationally, including here in Australia by our colleagues at Monash, the Find and Connect project, which we've been hearing about in earlier sessions at this conference. Earlier work highlighted that care experienced people's unique needs and experiences are not understood. The potential emotional impact of accessing records and of reading about childhood experiences that may have been traumatic or misrecorded is rarely taken into account. Access and recording practices across England are highly inconsistent with what's called a postcode lottery. Services can also be inconsistent between experiences, with our co-researcher Darren requesting his file three times at three-year intervals and receiving different documents differently redacted from the same authority each time. Support services are lacking, although accessing your files may be traumatic as well as therapeutic. Inadequate records management, both historic and current, makes it difficult to process requests. Many organizations do not really know what records they have and do not have a name index to identify individuals in the records. And there's also a lack of advice on how to apply the generic legislation under the Data Protection Act to an emotional and personal journey. There was a strong ethical and moral imperative for this research. 
Many care leavers turn to their social care records as primary sources to understand their childhoods, answer critical questions about what happened to them, and seek justice for abuse and neglect. In the case of one of our contributors, Susan, whose words are here, finding her records enabled a criminal proceeding that brought an abuser to justice 30 years after she'd first reported them. She'd spent over 20 years searching for her records, and her words really strike home the value of child social care records. So often, usually, I present, co-present with a care leaver. That wasn't possible here today. But I'd like to play you a short film about our project, which we made together, and which I think underlines some of these points. And the video brings our care leaver co-researchers' voices to you. In the Mirror Project, Memory, Identity, Rights in Records and Access, a group of researchers from UCL has worked together with the Care Leavers Association and a participatory research group of care leavers and care experienced people. We have tried to bring together our understanding of uh, records management and information access and governance to try to understand how that can be used to improve the lives of care experienced people. I left care at the age of 16 and it was in prison where I, uh, I had about my care files. I was a youth worker at the time. I had no idea before then that the local authority has got information about me and my time in their care. I was in my 20s and I'd not heard that I could access care records. So when I found out I could apply for my file, then I immediately wanted to apply for that information. I just wanted to try and um, put some of my memories back together because it became all jumbled up. I had some gaps in my history, gaps in my life that I wanted answers to, needed filling in. I did want to see, you know, like a little pattern of my past and see, you know, how it was written. I think it was probably quite more traumatic than I thought it would be, even going through the process of contacting people to access the records. He's meant to take a month and in my case it took over a year. The early impact on receiving my file was um, hugely emotional. It was a lot to take in in one go. I'd gone from a stage of not knowing the file existed to suddenly being presented with years and years of uh, my life and care. I found it very upsetting and I know that some people who've accessed their files are sadly no longer with us because they couldn't bear the information that they read. I found that it was more years down the line that it really affected me. There's so much um, emotional stuff that overwhelms you. You do need to put it down at some point and come back to it when you're emotionally capable or emotionally ready to deal with that. There's a real responsibility for practitioners to think about how that information might be received, in particular if it refers to a time of life where there was trauma. One day there's going to be someone like me that gets the whole collection of these reports and that's, that's my life. People need to be mindful that how stuff is written will impact on how that person feels about themselves. When records are, are written, they need to remember that this is a person. A lot of feelings and emotions are put across as if they're mine and I didn't always feel that way. What's sad about it is that my voice is really not in that, in that document. There's 126 pages, you have to get to page 51 before you hear me talk. There were silly things redacted from my file or blacked out. In the older records that um, my organisation has and other organisations have, the recording is very light touch. There's very little detail or emphasis on, on the actual child or young person or, or family group. There's not a great deal of involving the young person in, in the conversation around 
uh, what's going to be recorded or what their views are. Even as a, as a professional, as you're working on the files, that's actually quite sad because you know that that young person is, is there, but they almost don't feature in their own files. The records did not reflect the true relationship I had with my dad. The interpretations were inaccurate and the actions that were, take, that were taken were inaccurate. It is important that when information is being recorded by professionals, it's transparent. I think social workers do have a duty as a kind of corporate parent to try and think about the person's perspective and make it as clear as possible. Local authorities don't necessarily make people aware of the fact that you can access your files. I've been investigating with colleagues how we can make the accesses much easier for records relating to, um, to children in care. That information needs to be made as accessible as possible and that's why we've created the Family Connect project. It's one place where there'll be advice, information and support about how to search for information about your past but also what you might expect to come across in that journey of searching for information. For people who are care experienced, words, pictures are part of their identity and without identity there is no life. Our hope is that through the MIRROR project and through the partnerships that we've built during the course of the research that we'll be able to make a real tangible difference in supporting care leavers to exercise their information rights at the same time as supporting social workers and information practitioners to understand their information responsibilities. Okay, so you've heard some of the voices now of our co-researchers. Everyone has a story. Local authorities as corporate parents have a legal responsibility to ensure that information is kept about each child in their care since the Children Act 1948. Since 1989, records have to be kept for at least 75 years for accountability of the care provider and for the care leaver who may want to access their file later in life. What results is commonly known as a care file, a compilation of professional observations, reports, assessments and plans that has no equivalent really in family life. Care leavers may have very few photographs, keepsakes or memory objects from childhood. If they request access to their records, they are confronted with the product of a bureaucratic system that has analysed their every action. As Australian care leavers Jacqueline Wilson and Frank Golding have observed, the scrutiny of the official gaze may seem like a form of surveillance. A sentiment echoed by our research contributor John George, who said, it's like being under observation by the Stasi. But it may be one of the good things about having been in care as suggested by another of our contributors, for whom it provided access to the minutiae of daily life from 40 years ago. So in the rest of this presentation, I want to share with you some key findings and messages which we would gathered from the research, illustrated by some further material from our co-researchers. Our research shows that many people who grew up in foster and residential care have gaps in their childhood memories and unanswered questions about their early lives. They lack photographs, shared stories and mementos which help to create a sense of identity and belonging. Care experienced people must turn to records created about them by the state authorities and voluntary organisations who looked after them. These organisational records are their personal histories helping to reconstruct narratives about themselves in the past. Thousands of these requests are made each year in England under the subject access provisions of data protection legislation. However, care leavers report multiple challenges in finding, accessing and understanding their records. 
Bureaucratic processes, heavy redaction, and a lack of support leave people confused, frustrated, and re-traumatized. And this was explained by our co-researcher Darren in this quote as a cultural deficit. The second message is that finding information about how to access rec records is difficult. Processes are different for each organization and unfamiliar terminology is used, subject access, third party information. Once a request has been made, care leavers often wait a long time for information. Sometimes their records are missing or nothing has survived. Individuals may spend years trying to identify and secure access to records about themselves. Reading records may reinforce the worst memories of childhood and institutional authority, lacking positive narratives or key memory objects. With some notable exceptions, we found that few organizations provide adequate emotional support. A culture of compliance rather than caring means that little thought is given to the mode of delivery and presentation of the files, the provision of counseling, or the long-term impacts on the recipient. And Linda, one of our co-researchers, explained her experience of reading her file in, in this way on the slide. When records are received, they have often been heavily censored through redaction, which is rarely explained in understandable language. Our research found that in many instances, the removed information could have been provided but the redactor had not properly understood the rights and existing knowledge of the recipient, nor used their discretion in the disclosure of third party information under data protection. Social care records are interpersonal by nature, and information relating to parents, siblings, and extended family members may be critical to a person's life history. Extensive redaction often left people feeling powerless, frustrated, and angry as in Jackie's case, and that's an actual redacted page she was sent. That's not made up. Redaction is the main area of tension in the access process, both for the care lever and the staff making decisions about disclosure. For the care lever, redaction often appeared random and nonsensical, whereas for the staff, it was a psychological burden that was also highly resource intensive. Care leavers have many different reasons to access their records later in life. They may f wish to fill gaps in their memories or answer questions such as why was I taken into care or where did I live? They may be seeking specific medical or personal information or could be pursuing a legal case against abuse or neglect. In many cases, we found that the scope, quality and content of social care records is insufficient to provide a meaningful chronology of events and don't answer the questions care leavers have. Digital record keeping systems are often a barrier with word limits, checkboxes, fixed workflows, which frustrate social workers and reduce the child to an administrative process. Jargon and euphemistic language, prejudicial and judgmental perspectives, especially in older records, create a narrative that is uh, nevertheless viewed as an authoritative version of a young person's life and this may differ significantly from the experiences of the child themselves. Gina told us why she wanted to access her files, but do care files actually answer such questions? We also found that records are more likely to capture negative behavior or events than positive. Where positive language is used, it often describes the impact of social work interventions rather than the experiences or decisions of the child or young person themselves. As a result, records fail to capture the little good things that a person needs to construct a positive picture of themselves, and instead reinforces a catalogue of an individual's apparent failings, mistakes, and bad moments. The voices of children and young people are often entirely missing from their own records and where they are present, they may be paraphrased by a practitioner. Historically, records may have been authored by abusers or by those who ignored allegations. 
Even today, children and young people are rarely able to read or amend or annotate records. As a result, they are disenfranchised and may lack trust in record keeping, feeling that their voice won't be represented. This undermines the individual's ability to make sense of their life, value and identity through time. Although life story work is universally accepted as best practice, provision is patchy. The capacity to keep personal memory objects is extremely limited. As a result, very few of our co-researchers had fo many photographs of themselves as children. Records don't centralize the voice of the child, who is often silenced by the perspectives and interpretations of social workers. As a result, people feel alienated from the information they find in their records and experience conflicted memories as John George explained, and you saw him in the film. Fifthly, we found that, social, that records management of social care records across the public, private, and voluntary care sectors has been a very low priority. Many organizations have large stores of paper and digital records over which they have very little physical and intellectual control, putting many records at risk of loss. The introduction of digital systems has often been seen as a solution but without proper consideration for long-term sustainability or digital preservation. Standards of both physical and intellectual control of records are highly variable. Less than 20 years after the widespread adoption of digital systems, many records are stuck in inaccessible legacy programs or cannot be opened in original formats. Few organizations have catalogues and indexes which are sufficient to identify uh, specific material. They don't know when, how, and why records were created. They don't know how decisions were made about them, what was lost or destroyed, and especially where organizations have merged, changed jurisdiction, or closed down. John George, again, explained why this focus on safeguarding and compliance and a lack of care in record keeping really matters over the long term. This is a long game, life. Increasingly, records relating to services to children in care are created and maintained by private or voluntary organizations, often without clear contractual obligations to manage records in the longer term. While multi-agency working has helped to facilitate information sharing, it has also vastly increased the potential for duplication, error, and omission of records about an individual held across multiple information management systems. The different digital systems are generally proprietary and rarely interoperable. One of our record-keeping interviewees gave an example of the complexities. The legislative and regulatory landscape which currently governs records of out-of-home care is fragmented across more than a dozen acts and regulations. Overlapping regimes of information legislation, data protection, freedom of information, and social care legislation are rarely comprehensively understood. Our research found widespread confusion about what was and wasn't legal. This makes it difficult for those involved in record keeping to understand their information responsibilities and for care experienced people to exercise their information rights. The complexity of the landscape led to increased risk aversion within organizations, which manifested by, for example, excessive redaction. Rosie explained what happened when authorities don't understand the law properly. And we found that organizations cited concerns about legislation and regulation as reasons to limit access to records and as reasons for not changing their record keeping practice. We also found that records of state voluntary and private care organizations are often closed to research and independent scrutiny. This is especially troubling in cases where records have been submitted to the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse and where there is significant public interest in further historical investigation of actions and decisions. Organizations can then present their own narratives of past actions and injustices without any external verification. 
While researchers can be granted access to institutional records of care, we found a range of barriers in place. For example, organisations lack clear protocols for researchers, applying varied and generally risk-averse interpretations of legislation. And there's a lack of awareness of the public interest provision for research. Third sector and private sector bodies are not obliged to provide researchers with any access to their archives and records. They're not subject to the Freedom of Information Act, as this only applies to public authorities. And this is true even where an organisation provides a service commissioned and funded in the performance of a public task, such as social work. Gordon, one of our academic researchers, had some sympathy with archivists um, and said this on the slide. We found that researchers encounter a variety of responses to requests to view child social care records, especially when they relate to living individuals. These range from condition-free open access through to absolute refusal. One researcher encountered over a, different, a dozen different access processes and spent 15 months negotiating access to records. Requests to view the same document series for example, admissions and discharge registers centrally issued by the Home Office but held locally are treated differently by different archives. Inconsistent responses can be received from a single archive at different times. This means it's very difficult for researchers to plan and carry out research in the field. So the Mirror Project has made four recommendations in response to these findings and we've developed a set of principles and a toolkit to support organisations to help meet these recommendations, at least as so far as is possible currently within the law. First, that records should be co-created by all those invo involved in a child's care, including the child. They should be oriented towards the perspective of the child and young person so that their voice is centralised. Recording should be seen as a critical form of direct social work, taking into account an individual's lifelong needs for memory, identity and information. Participatory approaches such as co-production and shared custody should ensure that care experience people's information rights are explicit, well understood and respected. Secondly, all organisations with safeguarding responsibilities and guardianship of children's memories should have a records management plan for child social care records. These should outline processes for record creation, sharing and retention, including for longer term preservation. They should include better accountability and data sharing between the public, third and private sectors. Record keeping systems should be designed with the best practice principles of access by design. We found recording is ubiquitous but onerous, focused on managing risk. The implementation of systematic recording frameworks in the 2000s and the rise of digital systems has dramatically increased the demand for information. But this has been seen as a distraction from social work. Social care practitioners feel constrained by regulators and management. Digital systems have generated new record keeping practices. Um, um, but practitioners talk about a shift from rich narrative subjective recording towards a flatter mechanistic style. In general, records management of child social care records is quite poor. Uh, custodial arrangements are idiosyncratic. There's poor intellectual and physical control. And organisational knowledge of loss and disposal isn't known. Information sharing between agencies is a source of great anxiety. Thirdly, best practice approaches to access to records for all care experienced people and for research in the public interest should be developed. Protocols should balance the needs, rights and wishes of care experienced people, the responsibilities of institutions and the social benefit of research. Practical and emotional support is vital and should be made universally available to people of any age, underpinning access to records of a potentially traumatic nature. We found that the provision of access is inconsistent with some excellent practice in some areas and some extremely poor practice in others. Generally, the protocols overlook the unique personal relationship care leavers have with their records. The experience of making a subject access request 
replicates the dynamics of powerlessness and lack of self-determination experienced in childhood. Redacted text can feel like another way of the state asserting control not only over your person, but what you're permitted to know about yourself. <coughs> Information and social work practitioners are faced with challenging decisions, often without very specific training, and practical issues and lack of resources make change difficult. We think there needs to be better guidance on the application of data protection legislation to support organizations and information practitioners to comply in reasonable, caring, and considerate ways. Redaction decisions should be informed by an understanding of the specific circumstances of the individual's care experience, their unique needs, and a recognition of their right to understand their personal histories. <clears throat> Access to care records is managed, as I've said, under the Data Protection Act in the same way as any other request for personal data. The Information Commissioner's Office considers this mechanism adequate to care leavers' needs. Our researchers disagree. Data protection legislation does not provide for people whose personal histories are held by organisations and no account is taken of the emotional and personal impact. So our ambition now is to generate resources from our findings to support three core actions. Firstly, to support care leavers' rights to information, memory and identity through the creation of access to records resources that fill some of the gaps in guidance. We're working with the Care Leavers Association and with Family Action to do this and we anticipate these will be launched via the new Family Connect website in January. Secondly, to influence public policy debates about social care records by the creation of research briefs targeted at influencers and decision makers in government, in the Information Commissioner's Office, ICSA, the National Archives, Ofsted, who inspect children's services. Thirdly, to support practitioners and researchers to exercise their record-keeping responsibilities by co-creating a record-keeping framework that responds to the multiple needs of all parties. Um, the framework addresses the creation and management of records and offers some self-assessment questions and links to best practice guidance to practically apply our findings. A key feature of the record keeping framework is the 45, yes 45, <laughs> principles developed with our co-researchers. These principles aim to embody love and caring through record keeping. They are fundamentally about putting care experienced people at the heart of all record keeping processes. So the first principle from which all others stem is that care experienced people should be able to participate in every stage of child social care record keeping if they choose, including the creation of records while they're in care, the management of records during retention and the provision of access to records at any stage in life. These principles aim to these principles aim to shift the focus of records and record keeping away from risk management, bureaucracy and compliance and towards their role in supporting the well-being, identity and personal history of individuals throughout their lives. The creation of records should not be seen as a burden on overworked social workers but as a key part of therapeutic practices. Records management tasks such as indexing, retention and disposal become implicated in serving and supporting the needs of those with emotional and personal connections to the record. And information governance is resituated as a human rights function which has the capacity to heal rather than hurt. This is still a work in progress. We're hoping to get some follow-on funding in 2020 to enable us to continue to explore the application of the principles in practice, working with a software provider. We've also been working on a representation of human-centered participatory child social care record keeping, drawing on Greg Rowland's participatory continuum model, and combining it with a capability approach from social work, which focuses on what an individual can do based on their capability to imagine it and we plan to publish that later in the year for comment. There are now so many, there are now many country studies of care leavers' rights, and moving on to more comparative and multinational work seems an obvious next step. 
So in conclusion, this research has sought to enable care experienced people to untangle themselves and their childhood from the file, to make their voice heard in the record through time, and to move from a culture of record keeping for compliance towards a culture of caring and human-centered record keeping. And if you're interested in this work, we would love to have your feedback. So do get in touch, and there are a few leaflets and cards uh, around the room. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.